Hello, let's talk about the SDL titled cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. The gallbladder is a thin organ. It's histologically pretty unique. It's got a very thin lamina propria with a columnar absorptive epithelium on it. So technically that's glandular tissue, meaning cancers of the gallbladder are going to be adenocarcinomas most of the time. Congenital anomalies, they're just gonna say, what is this and give you a gross gallbladder to look at. That's the most that they can stretch that information. Gallstone disease at the bottom of page three. You really want to know the difference between these individual vocabulary terms. Talking about a cholelithiasis versus a cholecystitis versus a cholelithiasis because they're, they're all referring to different things in different anatomical locations and different processes. And that's gonna be one or two test questions on the exam is just gonna be, they'll tell you where a stone is. You know, they'll say, you've got a stone in a common bile duct and they're gonna say, what's going on? Cholelithiasis, acute cholecystitis, something, something, cholelithiasis, and that's the answer, cholelithiasis, okay? So pay attention to where the stone's at, just cause you have a gallstone doesn't mean it's Cholelithiasis. Yeah, you got it. You got it. So who gets gallstones? Women do, and they get it because of estrogen, which increases biliary cholesterol secretion. And cholesterol happens to be the most common constituent of gallstones. More than 80% of gallstones do contain cholesterol as their major component. You can also have pigment stones and mixed stones. Now, the mixed stone is the one you can just cross off the list because it's obvious. It's like, okay, it's got a little bit of cholesterol, a little bit of black and brown. The pigment stone, you got two subdivisions of that, subcategories. You got black pigment stones and brown pigment stones, and you really want to know the difference between both of them because they're not only found in different places, they arise from different etiologies. So cholesterol stones are yellow non-pigmented and then pigmented stones, which could contain some cholesterol, are comprised largely of calcium bilirubinate. And so that's bilirubin that's complexed with an ion of calcium. That's what gets it to crystallize. And bilirubin has a dark color. Um, bilirubin is the precursor to bile acids, right? And uh, bilirubin is the pigment responsible for the discoloration of skin and sclera that you observe in jaundice. And bilirubin gets turned into a bile acid, then a bile salt, and that bile salt gets farther modified down to stercobilin, which is the pigmentation in stool, and urobilinogen, which is the pigmentation in urine. Okay, so bilirubin has a color to it. Bilirubin is why we call those stones with bilirubin pigmented stones. Now, yellow stones, cholesterol, easy. We'll talk about those pigment stones. You really want to know black versus brown. Black pigment gallstones only occur in the gallbladder, inside the gallbladder, and they're due to hemolytic anemia. They're composed of unconjugated bilirubin polymers precipitated as calcium bilirubinate. What's by and large, the most common means of an unconjugated bilirubinemia. Anemia, hemolytic anemia, because bilirubin is made from that porphyrin ring that surrounds the iron in heme, in hemoglobin. Red blood cells have a lot of that. And so if you have red blood cells popping open all over the place, then they're spilling their heme. And that porphyrin ring gets taken and snipped and cut open and unfolded and that becomes bilirubin. So that's your unconjugated bilirubin. It's not water soluble. Remember, it's transported around in albumin. It gets to the liver. The liver tries to conjugate it. But if there's too much unconjugated bilirubin in the blood, the liver can't keep up fast enough. And some of that unconjugated makes its way down through to the gallbladder. And it spills in blood and it also reaches the gallbladder through the circulation. Brown gallstones, in comparison to black pigment gallstones, brown pigment gallstones can occur in the gallbladder or elsewhere in the biliary tree. So down the cystic duct, down the common bile duct, you can get a brown gallstone. They are also comprised of unconjugated bilirubin, aka calcium bilirubinate, and they can have some cholesterol in there too, which is different from black stones, which will not have any cholesterol. And you can also find bacterial residue within brown gallstones because the reason they're there is because you got a bile duct infection, period, end of discussion. That's the only way you get brown gallstones. 
So know you're black, know you're brown, know the calcium bilirubinate is unconjugated bilirubin. And no cholesterol, stones are made of cholesterol. Etiology, they're gonna to wanna to ask you a risk factor question. There's a ton of different risk factors for gallstones. They're gonna to wanna to try to mess you up like that. Uh, don't miss this one. Women get them, American women get them. Uh, very prevalent in the Western Hemisphere and in Europe, less prevalent in Africa and Asia. Obesity is a risk factor as is pregnancy. Um, estrogen, but also oral contraceptives and synthetic estrogen. Certain uh, conditions require uh, synthetic estrogen. You might want to give some estrogen analogs uh, to protect against osteoporosis, for example, in postmenopausal women or possibly in certain prostate cancers. Rapid weight loss is a risk factor for gallstone formation because anytime you lose weight, you have to be in a caloric deficit. And the way that most people get into a caloric deficit is they don't eat smaller meals, you know, because your brain does a really bad job of only eating 200 calories at a time. You know, if you have any other food laying around the house and you try to stop it, like five Cheez-Its, you know, like see if you don't eat more than five Cheez-Its, you know, you can't. And so people tend to lose weight by fasting. And when you fast, there's stasis of gall inside the gallbladder. All the cholesterol and the bile salts that go there from the liver just sit there and pool and build up because you're not releasing any CCK to need those bile acids squeezed out of there. And CCK is stimulated by fat in the duodenum and it's released by eye cells, remember? And so if you don't have any CCK, you've just got a gallbladder that's collecting sludge, literally. And that sludge sits around and crystallizes. That's it. Estrogen, we said oral contraceptives. A couple of drugs can give you gallstones. Clofibrate is one. Uh, cholestyramine is another. We mentioned gallbladder hypomotility, which is going to result in bile stasis. And that might not just be the fasting state. You know, it's also associated with uh, certain neurological injuries um, and total parenteral nutrition also. Uh, because, again, no fat going into the duodenum. And this is a really good time to point out something that they did not include in this SDL, but you have got to know is absolutely a risk factor or causative agent of gallstone formation is bile acid insufficiency. Because if you don't have bile acids, as we will very shortly see, all of the cholesterol that gets into your gallbladder is insoluble because cholesterol is a lipid and it really doesn't want to play nice with water. And because it's a lipid and it's majority hydrophobic, um, it can stack up on itself due to its planar structure. It's just a flat four rings kind of with a tiny little polar moiety down there at the end. And so those four rings will just stack like bricks and that's how cholesterol crystallizes. So if you don't have bile acids, you are absolutely at a higher risk of uh, obtaining cholesterol gallstones. And remember, there is a lot of conditions that can lead to a bile acid insufficiency. You could have gut malabsorption from something like a celiac disease or a Crohn's disease, right? Uh, you could get sprue. You could have an anemia, and that could give you a bile acid insufficiency uh, because maybe there's going to be some sort of jaundice with that. Um, you could have a cirrhosis, and the liver is going to be damaged and unable to conjugate all those bile acids. Uh, and finally, cholesterolamine, that's a drug that one can take that's uh, binding bile salts down into lumen of the gut and preventing their reabsorption. And so for a little bit there, you know, you're not going to have any bile acids because you're pooping them all out. So that's cholesterol gallstones we just talked about. Now let's talk about risk factors for pigment gallstones. I think this is also a likely question. Black pigment gallstones are strongly associated with anemias and disorders of hemolysis, hereditary spherocytosis. Some of you guys might know what that is. That's a defective spectrin protein that sits right at the internal membrane of red blood cells and helps them maintain their shape, their biconcavity. And if you don't have that spectrin protein, well, then you have a bunch of globe-shaped red blood cells in your blood, and that's not good because they need to be able to move and bend to accommodate to some very narrow capillaries throughout the body. And if they can't deform themselves due to the spectrum defect. They're beach balls, literally, you know, it's like a beach ball doesn't bend, it just pops. 
So that's what ha that's how you get an anemia in spherocytosis. And then there's beta thalassemia. Remember that is not the same thing as sickle cell, but we did learn about it in one of the same lectures. So just don't confuse those two in your mind. A beta thalassemia is a problem making the beta subunit of hemoglobin. Remember a normal hemoglobin has two alphas and two beta subunits. And then cirrhosis again is gonna cause a black pigment gallstone, cause yellow pigment gallstone, but it can cause black one too because with cirrhosis, you're going to get a splenomegaly because of the portal hypertension as blood has a harder and harder time making its way through that fibrotic liver. And so red cells are going to reach the spleen and pop, 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 leading to an increase in hemoglobin turnover. And in fact, almost half of all cirrhotics do have pigment gallstones. And remember, those are only in the gallbladder. You don't see them in the biliary tree. And the last point I have to say about that is that pigment gallstones might even be the presenting symptom of a hereditary anemia that's mild and someone doesn't even know that they have it, you know, but you can see absolutely see a 19, 20, 24 year old patient walk into your office and they're starting to jaundice a little bit, or maybe they're having uh, some pain, uh, colicky pain, shoulder blade radiating. And you're like, oh, why are they having a gallbladder problem? Could be an anemia. So then we talk about brown pigment stones and remember, Brown pigment stones are also made of uh, bilirubin, calcium bilirubinate, like black stones, but unlike black stones, brown stones are due to infection, not hemolysis. So what's the causative agent for that infection? Usually parasites, Ascaris, Lumbricoides, Clonorchis sinensis, Fasciola hepatica, those three uh, organisms do like to crawl up into and colonize the biliary tree. Um, so Ascaris is the, the uh, giant round worm. And I think that actually stays in the duodenum, if I'm not mistaken. And it'll block the major duodenal papilla. And that's how you're going to get, uh, or I guess it can crawl up in the biliary tree rarely. Clonorchis, that's the liver fluke. And that's the one that really gets up in the liver every single time by means of the biliary tree. It can not only lead to gallstones, but also uh, cancer of the gallbladder and cholangiocarcinoma as well. So brown stones infection, black stones hemolysis. They wanna ask you about that, they really do. And they wanna ask you about what's the stone made of, you know, calcium bilirubinate. And then they wanna ask you about one of these dumb sentences in the middle of this two page block of pathogenesis. They're gonna say, which of the following factors contributed to the formation of this gallstone? You know, like in that, in that high, academic type of way. They're going to expect you to just know exactly what went wrong. And so I've highlighted some sentences throughout this text that might help us get that question right if we do see it. So here's what happens. You get a lot of cholesterol and the cholesterol clumps together. Again, it crystallizes and that leads to stones. But it's not that simple, especially if you're going to be a doctor because you need to know every single part of this. So as we said, a bile salt deficiency is going to lead to stone formation. Why? Because bile salts emulsify cholesterol. So if you don't have enough bile salts, cholesterol doesn't dissolve in solution. It sticks to itself because it's hydrophobic. And that's stated in the text in the middle of page six here. Bile acids self-aggregate as simple micelles, binding a molecule of cholesterol leading to increased aqueous solubility of cholesterol. So that's the big idea from this first paragraph here. Then we talk about nucleation. And in order to form a crystal, you have to be super saturated with cholesterol. That means it has to be like 100%, basically. Um, there's a certain saturation point in terms of concentration, okay? Um, thinking like moles of cholesterol per unit of fluid. There's a certain cutoff concentration below which you can't form a crystal, above which you can. And anything above that cutoff is called supersaturation. So high concentration of cholesterol, that's cholesterol supersaturation. I wouldn't be surprised if that was like an answer choice on some question or a confounding answer choice because you know it sounds sounds super, you know, so it's like a couple of people might click that just thinking whatever, hey, it's super. Um, so again, the question from page six, page seven here, what they really want to ask is which of the following factors is causing this stone, you know? And so you would have to say something like, uh, 
excess gallbladder mucin. There we go. That could be an example because damage to the gallbladder, that stone putting pressure on the wall of the gallbladder is going to get the uh, cholangiocytes of the gallbladder to reactively um, produce some mucin so that they can stay alive, essentially. Calcium bilirubinate, again, the more bilirubin that you have, the more likely you are to get a stone. Calcium bilirubinate forms the nidus of cholesterol stones. And what that means is that you can't get a cholesterol stone, you can't get cholesterol to stick around anything and start to crystallize until you have a molecule of calcium bilirubinate at the middle of it. So once you get the crystal going, then cholesterol can stack up on itself. But that very first step, you need bilirubin to catalyze the, the blocky, think Minecraft-like construction of that crystal. Think Legos, you know, like you need a centerpiece there. That's the calcium bilirubinate. So if they ask you what is absolutely essential for these cholesterol stones to form, it's the bilirubin component. And then what else contributes to the formation of stones? Well, an elevated biliary pH. Uh, the text says that calcium salts of bilirubin are more soluble at acidic pHs, and therefore, the more alkaline, the higher you go, uh, the more likely you are to get these calcium bilirubin salts to precipitate and induce crystallization of cholesterol. Hypomotility is also obviously going to enhance the formation of crystals, just like it enhances the formation of clots. Remember, stasis is one of three parts of Virchow's triad. Nucleation is another term that's kind of thrown at you at the bottom of page seven here. And the best way I can explain this um, is when I was in Orgo Lab, we did an exp we did so many experiments where one of the steps was you had your uh, you had your product in a beaker and you had to take a glass stirring rod and you had to stir it up. But while you were doing so, you really had to scratch the bottom of the beaker to kind of stir up some particulate glass at the really, really atomic level, you know, and give your solution something to hold on to and form a seed crystal. It's that seed crystal concept, just like with the calcium bilirubate nidus, you know, you need something to start that crystal off. It can't just spontaneously grow. So that's nucleation from my understanding. Here's what they look like. Uh, I doubt they'll show you what they look like on an exam, on our exam, just because, I mean, it's too easy. You know, it's like, it's like, what else are we looking at that's going to have that shape? And they know that. So I, I feel like we might not see a picture, but if we do, you got it. Easy. Cholesterol. So that's all about cholesterol stones. Now let's talk about pigment gallstones again. Remember black pigment gallstones come from hemolytic anemias, situations of excess unconjugated bilirubin and that they only occur in the sterile gallbladder. You're not gonna see black pigment gallstones in the common bile duct. Hypersplenism from hepatic cirrhosis can also get a lot of red cells popped and throw some heme in the blood that gets turned into unconjugated bilirubin. And that's how you get your black pigment gallstones. They want to ask you about the mechanism of formation for that stone. Brown gallstones, again, you see brown pigment gallstones, you think infection. Could be a parasite, could be bacterial. Uh, it could be bacterial. Uh, there are a lot of anaerobes that colonize the gut that like to get up into the biliary tree. Uh, maybe strepneumo wood as well. I'm thinking enterococcus probably. Um, so be prepared to, you know, kind of stick and move if they throw you a micro question. But generally what they want to ask you, the easy question is, how did you get this brown gallstone? And the answer is infection, not hemolytic anemia, not none of the risk factors for cholesterol stone. Mixed gallstones, they're not going to ask you about that. You know, it's like there's going to be four right answers on that question. Clinical presentation of gallstones, we're at the top of page nine. You're going to get a colicky pain. It's going to be epigastric. It might radiate around the side and to the lower scapula. And it's usually around meals. So let's break that down. Colicky, what's that mean? You get colicky pain whenever there's an obstruction. And the pain is from some organ trying to contract against a brick wall, an obstruction. And so you can see colicky pain in settings of small bowel obstruction or 
maybe a tumor growing, an obstructive annular tumor in the descending colon. You can see a colicky pain there. You see a colicky pain in the gallbladder because the gallbladder is trying to squeeze itself empty, but it can't because there's a stone blocking the neck of the gallbladder. So that's colicky pain. Every time you squeeze and try to get stuff out, pain. And then you relax, no more pain. So that's why you get this pain around mealtimes, postprandially, and even worse after high fat meals because the more fat you eat, the more CCK you get, the more your gallbladder is trying to squeeze its contents out into the common bile duct. Cystic duct in the common bile duct. So what's the SDL say? Exactly what we just talked about. Pain termed biliary colic occurs when gallstones impact in the cystic duct during a contraction of the gallbladder. It's an intense, dull discomfort in the right upper quadrant or epigastrium that might radiate to the back, particularly the right shoulder blade. Remember the spinal levels we're thinking about for our viscerals from the gallbladder are going to be T6 through T11, I'm pretty sure. Uh, six through nine is a good start. And that scapula, remember the lower tip of the scapula is about at the T7 level. Um, the pain resolves as the gallbladder relaxes and the stone falls back into the gallbladder. So pain resolves as the gallbladder relaxes. What does that mean? It means the pain is based around levels of CCK. So six through 11, five through nine. Five through nine is a little bit more accurate because that's where that celiac ganglion plugs into uh, via the greater splanchnic nerve. No fever, no peritoneal signs in a case of biliary colic. Now, if you get acute cholecystitis, might start seeing those things because that's associated with infection and a very high degree of inflammation. Laboratory studies, normal, nothing to see there. And again, we're talking about uncomplicated gallstones right now. Imaging, uh, the big takeaway is that you are always going to say ultrasound. If they ask you, what, what imaging do you want for this patient? You know, and you diagnose a gallbladder disease, 100% ultrasound every time. Now, if it's the pancreas, you're getting a CT scan because you've got the stomach in front of the pancreas. And so it's a lot tougher to get a specific visual of the pancreas due to the presence of the stomach and the omentum on top of it. So gallbladder, pretty superficial. You can see it just fine on ultrasound. Now let's talk complications. What you want to know is gallstone ileus. What's ileus? Uh, complete loss of motility in the bowel. Why would you get it because of a gallstone? Well, because it's so big that it plugs up the ileocecal valve, typically, uh, down where your ileum meets your cecum, right? This small to large intestine transition. And what they want to ask you about this is they want to know how did the stone get in the valve, you know? Um, where did the stone originate, you know? And you're going to say cholecysta duodenal fistula. That's a direct communication from your gallbladder to your duodenum because they kind of sit next to each other. And so if you've got a big, especially a sharp or spiky stone, you know, I'm sure you've seen some jagged rocks before. Like we used to hunt and kill animals with stone arrowheads, you know, rocks are sharp. So it's like that stone just pokes a hole in the gallbladder, falls through, gets in the duodenum, goes down the line. There it is in the ileus, ileum rather. They also want to ask you again, where's the obstruction? Iliocecal valve. And so what are you going to see? Step ladder sign. Right? You're going to see those, uh, you're going to see air fluid levels too. One of those two. They're going to show you an x-ray and the patient's going to have air all up in the jejunum or ileum. So if they describe a patient with, again, an obstruction down at the ileocecal valve, they're going to say, how did that stone get there? You're going to say cholecysta duodenal fistula. Now, Merizzi syndrome, common hepatic duct obstruction caused by extrinsic compression from an impacted stone in the cystic duct. So what's obstructed? Common hepatic duct. Where's the obstruction? Cystic duct. Easy way to test you on just, do you know what it is? You know, um, 
Because you could ask, you could take this question because it's got like three variables in it. You could just change them around and there's your A, B, C, D, and E. And the differential for Marizzi syndrome is going to be cholidocolithiasis, which is a stone causing infection in the common bile duct. Now, let me walk that back. Cholidocolithiasis is a stone in the common bile duct that very commonly causes infection. It's not automatically infected, you know, but if you leave it there long enough, what do you think is going to happen to it? So, Marizzi syndrome, stone in the cystic duct, hepatic duct obstruction. Cholidocolithiasis, stone in the common bile duct, everything upstream is blocked. So, Again, know your vocab. This is so easy if you just understand what the terms mean. It's like directions, you know? It's like, do you know what up means? Do you know what down means? Do you know what right means? Do you know what left means? Like, that's kind of the complexity of this SDL so far. And then gallbladder high drops. We see high drops. We're thinking big and swollen. Uh, and that's going to be due to cystic duct obstruction. So this whole Marizzi syndrome could lead to gallbladder high drops as a consequence. Um, and then cholidocolithiasis, a stone in the bile duct. It does have three complications you ought to be aware of. Number one, obstructive jaundice. That's obvious. You're going to see a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And obstructive jaundice is basically the only cause of a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, which is bilirubin greater than 50% fraction of bilirubin in the blood. Acute pancreatitis makes sense. The farther the stone works its way down, which is, which is uh, correlated with how small the stone is, smaller it is, easier it is to get down there. And then ascending cholangitis, that's the infection. You see ascending cholangitis, you're thinking, okay, this thing is infected and we have to get this out of there quick before patient goes into sepsis because if you just walk a couple inches up the common bile duct, you know, you're in the common hepatic duct and then you're in the liver. And then if an infection gets into the liver, they've got access to the whole body. And so SIRS into sepsis, into severe sepsis, into MODS is absolutely a big risk of ascending cholangitis, secondary to cholidocolithiasis, secondary to gallstones. Now let's talk about acute cholecystitis. This is going to really hurt. Um, the patient, not you, though it, though it might hurt you. I don't know. We've done a lot of SDLs recently. So ACC, AAC, calculus, a calculus. No, we're not talking math. That was a long time ago. I remember that I took my last calculus exam and <laughs> I drank a lot of beer that night and I made a fat 72 on it and I didn't care. It was the best feeling in the world. That was the, probably the grade I'm most proud of in my life. The last calculus exam I ever took. That is not for me, yo. Um, so in acute calculus cholecystitis, you've got a stone that leads to necrosis, that leads to gangrene. What is gangrene? It's a bacterial infection on top of necrosis. So first you have the necrosis, then bacteria colonize the necrotic tissue. Now, we're going to flip ahead and compare that to acute acalculus cholecystitis, which is the exact same thing, except the first step is different. In acalculus, without a stone, cholecystitis, it gets kicked off by stasis of gall. So we're thinking trauma, neural injury, diabetic neuropathy, um, autonomic neuropathy. We're thinking um, starvation, fasting, post-operative. So something stops the gallbladder. And then eventually it just goes necrotic and gets infected. It gets gangrenous on top of that necrosis. So same thing is going on with both of these pathologies. One's got stones, the other doesn't. Now let's break down how they present. The, the with stones variant is going to be 90% of cases. And it's a general inflammatory response that is provoked by the mechanical stimulation of a stone pressing against the wall, the mucosa of the gallbladder. And so like, I don't know, um, imagine if you were walking, like imagine if you had to go to class and wear a 20 pound bicycle helmet. Okay, this is a really dumb analogy, but like eventually your neck is gonna get tired is what I'm saying, you know? So imagine the feeling of your neck getting tired with that big 20 pound weight sitting on your head all day. That is how the gallbladder feels when it has a stone in it. Necrosis follows shortly thereafter, depending on, you know, how old, how sick we are. And 
infection, gangrene gets right on top of that necrosis. So there are a couple of other stimuli. Phospholipase A is upregulated during trauma and creates lysolecithin, which is toxic to the gallbladder mucosa and propagates that inflammatory signal. That's all you need to know out of that paragraph. And then number three, bacterial infection. Of course, once you reach that gangrenous step, it's going to make everything worse. Uh, common organisms include E. coli, Klebsiella, Strep, Clostridium. And what do you see grossly? A big swollen gallbladder with a thick wall. And the longer it goes on, the more fibrotic that wall gets. But in the acute stages, the wall is thick because of fluid edema inside the wall because everything's vasodilating because of the TNF alpha and the interleukins. They're going to talk to your microvasculature and say, hey, we need you to blow up because we need to get some neutrophils in here. And remember, neutrophils are not going to enter a tissue until there is a, a, an appropriate uh, circulatory change, that upregulation of cellular adhesion molecules and vasodilation and leakiness to get those neutrophils shuttled into the target tissue. And then I also want you to remember that it's the neutrophils that are causing all the damage here, you know? It's like a, a very, very minimal amount of the actual damage is bacterially mediated. Most of the damage in this pathology to the gallbladder is caused by neutrophils spraying everywhere because they have proteolytic enzymes that produce reactant, reactive oxygen species like catalase, makes peroxide radicals. Um, so that's how you get the damage. The neutrophils make free radicals and that hurts the gallbladder. What do these patients look like clinically? Nothing you won't be able to figure out on your own. Just know this Murphy sign, understand what the Murphy sign is. You're going to palpate the gallbladder, essentially. Uh, you're going to find where it is, and then you're going to have the patient take a deep breath in. And, you know, when you breathe in, your rib cage expands, and so your gallbladder is going to go down and out, too, as it gets kind of pushed by that diaphragmatic expansion. And so if, when the gallbladder presses up against your fingers, if it is inflamed, then the nerves in the gallbladder are going to go ding, 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 and that's going to cause an acute exacerbation of the patient's pain. You're going to see leukocytosis in the blood. Um, it's got roughly the same timeline as appendicitis. It's got some of the same findings as appendicitis. Um, you might see abdominal guarding as you would an appendicitis. You might see fever as you would an appendicitis. Um, steady, severe pain as an appendicitis. So what am I trying to say? Like, in the real world, you know, when we're not taking an exam, appendicitis better be on your differential. Leukocytosis with the left shift. Again, appendicitis will give you that. IBD will give you that. Sonographic Murphy sign. You can produce some pain when you're just uh, kind of digging in there with that probe, that ultrasound head. Complications of acute cholecystitis, gangrene, check. Hemorrhagic infarction, check, makes sense. Perforation, makes sense too. There's a stone, everything around it is turned into mush. Of course it's gonna go straight through. So can you get peritonitis from that? Absolutely. Alternatively, instead of going into the peritoneum, the stone can go into the gut and that's a cholecystoenteric fistula. Could that lead to a gallstone ileus? Absolutely. Where's it going to happen? Ileocecal valve. Could that lead to appendicitis? Lord, that would be one unlucky patient. But yes, I suppose that could create an appendicolith. You know, if that gallstone just ding, 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 falls into that appendix, lumen. A calculus cholecystitis, again, same thing. A lot of necrosis, infection leading to gangrene. Uh, well, rather gangrene on top of necrosis. And uh, it starts off with stasis of the gallbladder rather than stones. You don't see stones. What you need to know about this one is that patients are in the hospital already. They're critically ill. They're typically pretty old. Already hospitalized, critically ill. So if they ask you about this, the patient's going to be in a hospital and critically ill. Imagine that. 
what do they want to ask? Well, what's causing it? You know, is it a stone or is it stasis? You know, like, is it an infection? Is it a liver problem? Because we have liver stuff on this exam too. Is it a pancreatic problem? So they're going to throw four differentials at you and the correct answer is going to be uh, acute acalculus cholecystitis due to gallbladder stasis. So the stasis creates ischemia because the buildup of too much bile is directly toxic to the gallbladder. That's in the middle of page 12 there. Underline it twice for the people in the back. And it has even been proposed to rename acute acalculus cholecystitis to acute ischemic cholecystitis to further clarify its main mechanism. So again, they wanna ask you about the mechanism, ischemia, ischemic cholecystitis. And you're gonna get a bacterial infection. Doubt they'll ask you about that. If they do, stick and move. A lot of different species as usual. Uh, what makes this unique on imaging is that you can't see it on a HIDA. And that's essentially a flow analysis of fluid into and out of the gallbladder. Uh, and so it, you take this scan over the period of like an hour and a half, two hours. And if there's a stone, then you're going to be able to detect the obstruction in the bile duct or cystic duct or gallbladder neck, wherever the stone is, because everything downstream from the stone won't take up the radio labeled dye. But if you have a calculus cholecystitis, you don't have an obstruction. So you're not gonna see it on some imaging techniques. Again, you always get an ultrasound of the gallbladder. Uh, decent mortality rate, 30%. Acute emphysematous cholecystitis, emphysema. What do you remember about emphysema? Air gets trapped in the lungs, can't breathe out. So, emphysematous cholecystitis is air in the gallbladder lumen, wall, or pericholecystic space. You're going to get an ultrasound for it. CT is the test of choice, but CT is not your first test for general gallbladder diagnosis. Uh, what they could ask you, they could show you an x-ray or a CT, and the gallbladder is basically going to be empty on the inside, and they could just say, what's the diagnosis, you know? And they're just going to be testing to see if you know what emptiness looks like on imaging. Chronic cholecystitis, same thing we've been talking about. Patients got long, ongoing colicky based around meals, pain that's associated with uh, not really 6 through 11, 5 through 9, I don't know. It depends on what source you ask, if you ask me. Uh, so you've got this 5 through 9 pain in your paraspinals, tart changes. That's going to be in the question stem uh, for any gallbladder disease as well, you know. Uh, what do you see in chronic? You see chronic infiltration or chronic immune infiltration, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and monocytes. You see fibrosis of the gallbladder wall, and you might see gastric metaplasia of the epithelium because it's been damaged for so long. That's about all I could see them asking you about for chronic because nothing else is really too different from acute cholecystitis here. Again, clinically, you've got this pain that's there, and then it's not, then it's there, then it's not. It's probably going to radiate. Uh, it's due to CCK again, because the gallbladder is trying to contract, but it can't get its stuff out. And when you contract an inflamed tissue, it really hurts. You know, it's like, think about trying to go to the gym and do squats five days in a row. It's like day five, your legs hurt, you know, you must be stupid before you can become wise. Preferred treatments, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Now we talk about porcelain gallbladder. Uh, same thing as the emphysematous gallbladder. They're really just going to show you a picture of this and say, do you know what's going on? And what they also might ask you is like, what are you at a greater risk of? And the answer to that is going to be gallbladder carcinoma. They also might throw you this uh, as a differential in a liver cyst image, or maybe they'll throw liver cysts and tumors as a differential and they want you to pick this. Um, you got to recognize that cysts of the liver are not going to show calcifications on CT. And the fact that this gallbladder is calcified is why we call it a porcelain gallbladder. You pull it out, you know, and it's like, it's like grandma's China, you know, it's like this thing could like sit on a shelf. It's a gallbladder. Um, so what's the pathogenesis obstruction of the cystic duct, calcium salts buildup. This is an example of dystrophic calcification. 
And then, uh, again, increased risk of gallbladder carcinoma, uh, which is a serous adenocarcinoma, serous meaning dense, tough, fibrous. And there's like six different risk factors from it. So when you get to that STL, make sure you pay attention to the risk factors for gallbladder cancer. They are super numerous, seemingly. Cholesterolosis is characterized by foamy macrophages in the lamina propria of the gallbladder. Where else have we seen foamy macrophages? We've seen them in the tunica intima of large arteries. That's called atherosclerosis. And cholesterolosis of the gallbladder is when the same physiologic process happens in the gallbladder. So what does it look like? Big yellow lumps, nodules. This is called a strawberry gallbladder. So this is yet another question that the most obvious way for them to ask this, or really kind of the only way for them to ask this, is to show you a picture of it histologically or grossly. And I mean, there's nothing you're going to mistake this for, nothing else that you can confuse this with in this SDL, so you're good. All right, that's SDL 26, cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. Thank you very much.